also good morning to those who are online we will begin our very last session of this semester um so we have been looking at so many doctrines uh, throughout this uh, these four months today we have come to the very last doctrine the doctrine of the end times um so let's get started then yeah so doctrine of the end times talks about the things which will happen in the very last days and in fact we uh, you know seeing the kind of uh, circumstances and events that are taking place today we do realize that we are reaching those end times i mean we are almost in the end times so it is good for us to know about these things um next year uh, you know when you uh, when you guys come to the second year you will have an entire four month course on the end times so at that time you will be discussing the end times in great detail uh, so today we will not get to that much detail uh, we will just look at a few doctrinal facts some doctrinal truths which are there in scripture regarding the end times but of course next year when you have the course uh, you would go into it in great detail so um, let us begin by looking at one scripture acts chapter 17 verses 24 and 25 uh, which talks about god having created the world and um, yeah his purposes for it acts 17 24 to 25 x 17 verse 24 god who made the world and everything in it since he is lord of heaven and earth does not dwell in temples made with hands nor is he worshiped with man's hand as though he needed anything since he gives to all life breath and all things yeah so in this scripture we see that god is the one who made the world and everything in it and he didn't create the world and the people in the world and the animals in the world because he needs them um like it says over here he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything rather he created the world he created humans he created animals uh, because he had a purpose in mind so it's not that god needed these things he needed us because of which he made these things he is self sufficient he does not require us in any way rather we all have been created because he has a plan and a purpose for us so everything that is happening today all the things which took place in the past all of it is leading towards something very definite god has a very definite plan and purpose in his mind uh, the people of the world have this impression that you know we just uh, accidentally come into creation and then we just simply live uh, based on how circumstances take us if things are going well for us our life moves in a good direction on the other hand you know if we've had bad experiences then um, uh, life will not work out very well so people have this idea that everything is so random and accidental and things are just happening because they just happen to happen you know that is the view which uh, the world has but in scripture we get to know that god right from the very beginning even before creation was made he had a plan he had a purpose so right from that time he's moving everything along the timeline with something very specific in mind so when the final end times come it's not like he's taken by surprise and he's wondering what to do with the way things have turned out no even before creation he already knew how things would go the decisions which people would take the uh, the choices which godly people would make and also the choices which ungodly people would make and what would be the result of all of those things and what would be his intervention in you know using all of those things to accomplish his purposes so in everything 
he has already he has always been in charge he knows exactly what he is doing so nothing takes god by surprise everything is so organized from where he is sitting we who are living over here we may think oh my these are such confused times uh, the, you know, the church is uh, not able to win the church is not having victory we believers are struggling uh, life uh, seems to be so uh, hazy we have no idea what's awaiting us so we may think all those thoughts down here because we can't see the entire picture but god who is seated on his throne for him everything is crystal clear he knows exactly what everything is moving towards and when it comes to our individual lives he didn't create us because he needs our prayers or he needs our worship he created us because he has a plan in his mind for us and for the world so um, this is this is another scripture which points out that colossians chapter 1 verse 16 if someone could read out colossians 1 verse 16 For by him all things were created that are in heaven and are on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. Exactly, it says here that all things have been created through him and for him. So if we exist today, if we have been created, it is for him to fulfill his plan. if the world is uh, you know has been orchestrated and the events in the world are moving in a certain direction it is for him to accomplish his plan for this world and for this universe so everything is very organized and everything is moving towards the end times in a very in a very uh, particular specific direction the lord is in charge so we may it may appear to us that evil is winning it may appear to us that satan is having more and more control but actually the fact is that everything has been created through him and for him everything is being held together by him you know by jesus and so uh, the lord has a plan so even as we are going to be talking about the end times today we are looking at god's future final plan for us for the church for the world for um all the uh, events which are going to be taking place he has a definite plan and purpose for all of it so we basically study this doctrine of end times for three reasons firstly we realize that this uh, study of the end times helps us to know that we have a definite purpose we are not just simply randomly moving through you know one week after another so this week certain you know uh, events and circumstances will happen to us then next week something else will take place and the us you know life goes on we adjust we adapt no it's not just that we are if we commit ourselves to him and if we listen to his voice he is moving us in a very clear definite direction so the study of the end times gives us the assurance that we are moving towards some very specific future plan which god has for us uh, let's look at a scripture uh, a couple of scriptures which talk about that second uh, timothy chapter 2 verses 11 and 12 second timothy 2 11 and 12 here is a trustworthy saying if we died with him we will also live with him if we endure we will also reign with him if we disown him he will also disown us you know in the scripture it says here is a trustworthy saying this is a saying which we can completely trust what is the saying the saying is that if we endure we will also reign with him so you and i who are sitting over here you know in the class today those of us who are you know attending online we all are moving towards a day when each of us will be involved in ruling and reigning 
I mean, it may it may almost you know sound ridiculous for the people of the world if they were to look at us. They would say, "Ha, huh, a bunch of students who are not very influential or very powerful or very rich. What on earth are they going to rule over and reign over? I mean, you know, they are not even in politics. What on earth are they going to achieve? But you and I are actually moving towards that end time plan of God that we." are going to rule and reign with him one day and it says over there in second timothy you know paul is writing his very last letter is writing to timothy and he says this is a trustworthy saying our lives are not random we are moving very specifically towards that one final day when we those of us who are actually you know right now in the class and and online we are going to rule and reign with the lord jesus and in fact in first corinthians 6:3 you know it says do you not know that we will judge angels so you and i will actually participate in judging the angels one day you know so uh, in helping decide what level of punishment they should be given the fallen angels so we are moving towards something very powerful towards something very great so if we are sitting here in this bible college and going through these classes it's not because you know we have nothing better to do with our lives we are equipping ourselves for something that is awaiting us something grand that is awaiting us in the end times so let us live this life live every day with this awareness that you and i are not just average people we have been created through him for him to participate with him and share with him in kingship one day so you know let us equip ourselves with keeping that in mind the second thing that uh, the uh, this study of the end times helps us with is that it encourages us to hold on up to the end um uh, a scripture which you know uh, gives us assurance regarding this um, revelation 2 26 to 27 you know jesus uh, speaks these words to one of the uh, seven churches that he sends a message to and uh, what he says to this church is relevant for all of us revelation 2 26 to 27 to the one who is victorious and does my will to the end i will give authority over the nations the one, that one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery just as i have received authority from my father so the lord says if you continue to be victorious right up to the end i will give authority over the nations this is the promise which god is making to his people he says in the same way i was given authority and i ruled with an iron scepter in the same way you also will receive authority you will rule over the nations therefore you know god is encouraging us to continue to be victorious up to the end not to give in not to give up but to continue victorious up to the end the third reason that we are you know uh, studying the end times is so that we will have hope even when we face you know uh, uh, sickness or death uh, that would be first thessalonians 4 maybe verse 13 and also verse 18 first thessalonians 4 13 and 18 but i do not want you to be ignore, ignorant brethren concerning those who have fallen asleep lest you sorrow as others who have no hope verse 18 therefore comfort one another with these words when somebody passes away you know when they die the people of the world they mourn and they grieve because they think this is it we will never see this person again we will never be able to talk to them again and so there is no assurance no hope for them but then we who know about the end times we who know what is awaiting us in the future we have a great hope and much excitement because this loved one 
who has died is going to share with us in the glory is going to share with us in the future plans which god has so uh, yes it is painful that we will not be able to you know interact with them for many years to come but one day for the rest of eternity they will be with us so they, so we have this beautiful hope so we study the end times for these reasons uh, so let's get into the actual subject of end times uh, there are um, six signs given in the bible regarding the second coming of jesus christ uh, let's very briefly look at all of these six signs the first sign about uh, the coming of uh, about the second coming is found in matthew 24 verse 14 yeah if someone could read out matthew 24 verse 14 and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nation and then the end will come when will the end come the end will come after this testimony of the gospel is preached to the whole world so once all the people groups of the world have been reached once the gospel has been shared with all the people groups then the end will come so one of the first signs of the end uh, of the second coming is that the gospel message will start spreading to all the people groups of the world and we see that happening god is at work behind the scenes he is using committed surrendered people to reach out to different uh, people groups so um, this is one of the signs that the, uh, the the second coming is near the second sign that we see of the end times uh, that would be romans chapter 11 verses 25 and 26 romans 11 25 and 26 romans 20 yeah romans 11 25 and 26 romans 11 25 and 26 lest you be wise in your own sight i want you to understand this mystery brothers special harming has come upon israel until the fullness of the gentiles has come in and in this way all israel will be saved as it is written the deliverer will come from zion he will banish ungodliness from jacob it says here in romans 11 verse 26 in this way all israel will be saved so a second important sign of the end times is that we will see many jewish people accepting jesus as lord and savior there was a time when uh, the uh, people of israel were hardened in their hearts uh, they did not want to receive jesus as their messiah but in the end times we will see a great move of god and we will see a lot of jewish people coming to the lord jesus i mean who knows the things which are happening you know in israel today maybe god will use this to draw people to himself because when things are going well people see it don't seem to really think about god but during times of difficulty you know they draw near to god so the lord will use different events and different circumstances to bring the the jewish people to a to a stage where they will be willing to hear the gospel message where they will begin to respond to the true messiah so a second important sign that we uh, we are actually seeing now is uh Jews coming to the Lord Jesus i mean there are so many testimonies of jewish people you know who regard uh jesus christ as somebody very uh bad they believe him to be a prophet but they regard him as somebody who is against their jewish faith and people like that through miraculous circumstances are coming to the true faith they are you know uh facing severe opposition from their friends and relatives 
and their community and still they are stepping out and taking a step of faith for the Lord Jesus. We are seeing this happening, you know, more and more. So Jews are coming to the Lord Jesus. That's a very important second sign of the end times. A third sign which we see uh, that that is mentioned in Mark chapter 13, 7 to 8. Mark 13, 7 to 8. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nations will arise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginning of birth pains. It says that nation will rise against nation. Uh, earthquakes will take place. Famines would be there. These are the beginning of birth pains. You know, uh, when, when, when we see this happening, wars are increasing, uh, we see famines increasing, uh, there are earthquakes and tsunamis and all of this. When these things are taking place, we may think, oh, this is the end. But look at the wording over here. It says these are the beginning of birth pains. This is not the end. In fact, it is the beginning. So something very beautiful is about to start. So rather than thinking about, you know, uh, in terms of everything ending and coming to a disastrous end, let us realize that these very negative things are not talking about complete destruction. These negative things are in fact pointing towards the beginning, the birth of something very great and something very special, which will be the second coming of Christ. And then a whole bunch of very, very marvelous things will be released one by one. Okay, so um, these terrible events, they are pointing towards the birth pains of something very beautiful which will be birthed in the future. Uh, coming to a fourth sign which we will see, um, that would be Mark 13, 22. Mark 13, 22. Mark 13, 22. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and saw signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So there would be a rise in the amount of false teachings. There will be false messiahs, false prophets, who will actually be able to perform all kinds of signs and wonders. And because they are moving in the supernatural, people will assume that they are good, that what they are, uh, what they are teaching is correct. And they will you know, uh, reject what is there in the Bible. And instead, they will go after these teachers. So there will be an increase in the amount of false teachings. There will also be an increase in the, uh, in the supernatural activities that these false teachers are able to do. That would be the fourth sign. All of these four signs, we actually see them happening with our eyes today. So the first four signs of the end times, are already taking place. We're already experiencing them. The last two signs of the end times have not yet come to pass. Uh, the first would be 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 7 to 9. 2 Thessalonians 2, 7 to 9. Shall I go ahead, sister? Please go ahead. Yeah, yeah, sure. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who knows all sit back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the light. Yes. In the fourth sign, we saw that there will be an increase in, in the number of false teachers who can do supernatural things. But the fifth sign is talking about a very specific person whom the Bible refers to as the lawless one. 
or the man of lawlessness this person he will be worse than all the other false teachers he will use very uh, you know um, very awesome displays of power to deceive people into thinking that what he is teaching is right and in fact he will set himself up as god so it's talking about the last uh, the final antichrist who will one day come so this fifth sign has not yet taken place and this one more sign which has not yet taken place uh, that would be in uh, mark 13 24 and 25 mark 13 24 and 25 mark 13 24 verse 24 and 25 but in those days after that revelation the sun will be darkened and the moon will not keep its light the stars of heaven will fall and the powers in the heavens will be shaken yeah so this will be like in almost around the end of the tribulation period at which time creation itself will start being affected um the heavenly bodies in the sky will experience you know um d- different catastrophic uh, events so these things will happen in the very very end so this last two signs we don't yet see them happening the first four signs we can actually give examples we can see those things taking place among us already so which means we are very much you know in that last phase of the end times we have already entered it so the second coming is nearing we can be sure of this the time of course is unknown in fact this is what we are told about the timing of the second coming acts chapter 1 verse 7 if someone could read out acts 1 verse 7 acts chapter 1 verse 7 and he said to them it is not for you to know times or seasons which the father has put in his own authority it's very clearly told over here that we are no it is not for us to know when exactly it will happen so you know even as we have every year at least one or two um uh, preachers you know predicting and saying the second coming will happen at so and so uh, such such a time those are all wrong predictions simply because here in acts 17 we are very clearly told it is not for you to know the times or dates that the father has set you know regarding the end time events so nobody will be able to predict accurately about the end times they will all be wrong in their predictions simply because it is not for you to know nobody has been given that authority okay no believer has been given that authority to know about the exact date and timing however when it does take place it will be a very personal event you know i mean uh, if you have uh, the prime minister coming and visiting our city it's something that is uh, interesting but it's just something that is happening out there you know like if modi comes uh, to bangalore yeah we know that modi has come you know we may we may watch that on the television uh, news but it's got nothing to do with us personally on the other hand when this jesus comes it's a very personal thing it's something so beautiful uh, look at what jesus says in john chapter 14 verse 3 regarding his second coming john 14 3 John chapter fourteen verse three, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am there you may be also. So the reason that Jesus is coming back is because you know he's gone over there to heaven to prepare a place for each one of us. He's excited about what he has prepared for us. and is coming back to collect us and take us over there so that we can enjoy what he has prepared for us so that we can be with him always for eternity so the second coming is a very personal event he is personally thinking of you specifically even as he is you know getting ready for the second coming it's not just coming for the people of the world as such you know in general he's coming specifically for you because he has prepared a place for you and is prepared a plan for you in this end time and he will come and take you so that you can enjoy that with him you know on that day so um, this is what it says in matthew 25 verse 31 uh, yeah someone could read out matthew 25 31 matthew chapter 
verse 31 when the son of man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him then he will, he will sit on the throne of his glory yeah so the son of man when he comes in the in the second coming he will come in his glory and he will sit on his glorious throne now this is what it says in second thessalonians 2:14 second thessalonians 2 verse 14 second thessalonians 2 verse 14 to which he called you by our by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our lord jesus christ it says here that when the son of man comes in his glory and sits on the throne of his glory when he sits on his glorious throne we are told in second thessalonians 2 14 that we will share in this glory of the lord jesus i mean it's such an amazing thing you know we have not we have not done anything to earn it it is just something that is freely being given to us out of love so the end times are not something boring rather it is something exciting and it's something very personal and we are all supposed to be looking forward to it um so uh now let us look at some verses regarding the second coming and the details that are given about it so that we will know how it's going to happen and in what way it will take place and what should be our expectation uh, so after having looked at uh, you know a kind of general idea about the second coming now we are getting into specifics about how it would take place what would be some of the events which will happen at that time uh, when the second coming happens uh, let's begin by uh, with acts chapter 1 verses 11 and 12 as far as i know i have not covered this over here in this particular class uh, if i have you know please uh, one of you let me know but i think we have not done this before acts chapter 1 verses 11 and 12 if someone could read out acts chapter 1 verse 11 and 12 who also said man of galilee why do you stand gazing up into heaven the same jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven then they returned to jerusalem from the mount called olivet which is near Jerusalem, a seven days journey. Yeah, so here in Acts chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, we get to know that um, Jesus you know, ascends back into heaven from the Mount of Olives. So the um, all the people gather, you know, the, his followers, his disciples and his followers gather together on the Mount of Olives. Jesus is there along with them. He speaks to them and then he's taken up into heaven and they're all staring up into the sky even as jesus is, is ascending into the heaven and then the you know uh, the angels they say to they say to the people in the same way that he has gone he will come back so the general belief is that when the second coming happens he will come down to the mount of olives that's basically where he will descend uh, and in fact, Zechariah 14.4 says the very same thing. Zechariah 14 verse 4. Zechariah uh, chapter 14 verse 4. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountains will move towards the north and half of it towards the south. So both in Zechariah as well as in Acts chapter 1, we are told that when the second coming happens, the Lord will descend upon the Mount of Olives. And in Zechariah 14, we are told that when he comes, he will come to fight against the nations. He will fight against all wickedness. And then, uh, you know, the end will come. So we are told that the second coming will take place on the Mount of Olives. So if that is the case, then how do we understand the second Thessalon the first Thessalonian passage, which talks about uh, you know us meeting the Lord in the air? Over there, there's no Mount Olives being talked about. So 
how do we understand that passage? Let's look at that. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. First Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the term, term, trumpet of God and the death in Christ will raise first verse 17 then we then we who are alive and remain shall be catch up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and thus we shall always be with the Lord yeah so here it's talking about how the Lord will come in the clouds and we will meet him in the air you know, the wording is very, very clear. I mean, it's, it, this is something which is actually going to happen. And we see this uh, mentioned also in uh, 1 Corinthians. So it's not like as if, you know, this is the only place where it is mentioned. In 1 Corinthians 15 also, we are told the same thing. So here it's talking about an event where the Lord will just come in the clouds. He will not come down all the way to Mount, uh, to the Mount of Olives and rest his feet on the mountain. Rather, it just talks about how he will come in the clouds and we will rise up to meet him in the air. So this is how we get to know that there are two separate events which will take place. There will be a separate rapture event. That's just a term, you know, uh, the, uh, a Latin term which, uh, which was used to talk about this uh, second Thessalonian, the, to talk about this first Thessalonian event. Uh, and also to talk, you know, to talk about the First Corinthians 15 event, the word rapture um, is used for that. And then you have the actual second coming, where Jesus will come and stand on the Mount of Olives. So uh, this is how we understand it. This is how most of the church understands it: that before the tribulation period begins, the Lord will come to collect His people. Because the tribulation period is a time when the people of the world will undergo a severe tribulation. You know, usually when we think of the word tribulation, we think in terms of the church suffering. Yes, it is true. The, church, uh, the, 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 the people of God, okay, not the church because the church will be taken up in the rapture. But the people of God, the ones who become believers in, the, in those days of the tribulation, will undergo a, a great suffering. But that word tribulation actually is talking about the judgment which God is going to start releasing upon the world and its people. So before the tribulation period can begin, the Lord will collect his church because the church is, God does not want to bring judgment upon the church. The church is meant to be redeemed. The church is meant to be saved and, and, and it is meant to share in his glory. It is not really meant to be suffering. So, the Lord will collect his people before this terrible time of judgment starts. So, before the tribulation period can begin, the Lord will come in the clouds to collect his people. So, those who are already in heaven, the believers who are already there, they will come along with Jesus in the clouds. And those who are alive here on the earth, they will rise up to meet him in the air. And all of them will together return back into heaven. So this is not the second coming. The second coming will happen after the tribulation period. So before the tribulation period, you have the rapture event happening. And 1 Corinthians 15 also talks about the same thing. Um, if someone could read out 1 Corinthians 15 verses 51 and 52. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52. 1st Corinthians chapter 15 verse 51 and 52 Behold I tell to you my mystery we shall not all sleep but we shall all be charged in 52 in a in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet for the trumpet will sound and the death will be raised incorruptible in, and we shall be changed. It says over here, uh, it's basically repeating what we already looked at in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. It talks about how uh, 
people will be changed uh, they would receive their resurrected bodies so in first thessalonians chapter 4 this is what we read it says over there you know when the trumpet call of god is sounded at that moment the dead in christ will rise first which literally means that the dead bodies of people who have been buried in the ground of people who have been cremated of people who have been drowned at sea whatever they wherever the 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 basic ma- matter of their dead body is that will get um collected and it will be transformed into a resurrected body and these believers who have died and who are in heaven with god when they come down along with jesus in the clouds they will receive this resurrected body in that moment so in first corinthians 15 it says in the twinkling of an eye in a moment in a second that person will get back their body only thing now that body will no longer be in its in its perishable human state it will become a resurrected body and then in, in the first thessalonian 4 passage we are told we who are still alive we will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the lord in the air so even we we will also we will also receive our resurrected bodies which is what it says in in the first corinthians passage um where it says um for the trumpet will sound the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed so even we who are still alive and we are caught up in the rapture we also will be changed we also will receive resur- resurrected bodies so this is the resurrection event which is talked about over here um when we use the word resurrection we are basically talking about somebody who comes back to life and they will never ever die again ever they will always continue to be to to exist forever and ever and ever for all eternity so the resurrection is basically talking about that event where a person once they receive their resurrected body they will continue to live with it for infinity forever and ever they will never again stop existing so it's talking about that kind of an event over here um so if we were to you know just look at a couple of verses regarding the resurrection the very first person who got resurrected in this manner was our representative the lord jesus as our representative he died for us we died along with him we were crucified in him and then when he rose up we also you know symbolically rise up with him and in the same way he has received a resurrected body we too will receive resurrected bodies one day so um first corinthians 15 verses 20 and 23 talk about this first corinthians 15 20 and 23 first corinthians chapter 4 15 verse 20 but now christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep verse 23 but each one in his own order christ the first fruits afterward those who are in christ at his coming so the very first person to undergo this resurrection experience was the lord jesus he died he was buried for 3 days and 3 nights but after that when he rose up he rose up with a resurrected body which will never ever perish again and he did this as our representative so all of us who have placed our faith in him we also will undergo this experience one day when that rapture happens when he comes along with all those who are all the believers who are there in heaven when he comes along with them in the clouds those who are still alive will rise up into the air so the ones who have who are who are coming down along with him they will first receive their resurrected bodies the flesh which has become maybe dust that dust will literally get lifted up into the air 
will become a resurrected body they will be reunited with their resurrected bodies and the ones who are rising up into the air who are still alive they will experience a transformation in the twinkling of an eye and they too will be changed so this is the resurrection event that is talked about and then we will see that there are other parts to this the resurrection happens in stages for different sets of people so the first thing that we see the first resurrection event is mentioned over here about jesus having received it first and then we uh, who who will also experience it during the rapture um after this uh, there will be other resurrection events which we will come to later but right now immediately after the rapture the tribulation period will begin this is going to be the time of god's judgment from the beginning of time god has always been saying that a day of the lord will come you know when judgment will be brought so this the tribulation period is like the first stage of the day of the lord the day of the lord of course will be the final judgment when the second coming happens but this tribulation period will start leading up to the final judgment during the tribulation period god will judge the people of the world in different ways and the people will hate the lord because he is judging them and they will hate the people who are turning to the lord and placing their faith in him so the reason that the believe whether the believers in the tribulation period will go through a tough time is because the the people of the world will hate them and put them through intense suffering so the tribulation is not really targeting the believers who will be who will, who will become saved at that time rather the tribulation is targeting the unsaved people and the unsaved people will take out their anger upon the believers who are accepting him during those days the church would have got raptured all the people who have placed their faith in the lord up to that point of time will be will be taken up into heaven so the new believers who place their faith in the lord during the tribulation time they will go through a lot of suffering because the people of the world will hate them because they know that god is judging them for their you know sinful lifestyles so um, in revelation chapter 6 all the way up to chapter 18 in great detail we are told about how the tribulation period will take place step by step so all the way from chapter 6 up to chapter 18 of revelation we see are uh, different stages of the tribulation period happening and at the end of the tribulation period is when Jesus comes back he will stand on the mount of olives and he will come to judge the nations and to fight the nations okay so they uh, so a great war will take place at that point of time so uh, the tribulation period basically goes through three main stages um the first is the stage of the seven seals it talks about how the seven seals will be opened every time one of the seven seals is opened a rider goes out on a horse and he will bring some kind of judgment upon the people so the when the first seal is opened you have a, a rider on the horse riding out to bring judgment and the second seal is opened you have a different rider going forth to bring judgment so the seven seals are opened one by one then the second stage of the tribulation period is when the seven trumpets are blown when the first trumpet is blown something will be done to the creation judgment is is brought upon the people of the earth through the destruction of creation so in the when the seven seals the first stage when that is taking place the people are judged in different ways when the second stage comes when the seven trumpets are blown the people are still being judged but now it's creation which is being affected for instance you know when when uh, when one of the trumpets is blown all the trees i think one fourth of the trees are burnt when another trumpet is blown uh, you all the fresh water supply becomes bitter uh, not all uh, i think one fourth or three fourths i don't really remember the percentage that will be there in the scriptures and then uh, you have another uh, trumpet being blown at which time you know you will have the stars in the sky being af- uh, affected so the first stage 
when the seven seals are being opened, you will have riders going out from God to bring different kinds of judgment. The second stage is when the seven trumpets are being blown. At that time, creation will start getting destroyed stage by stage. The trees are burnt, the sea waters uh, turn into blood, it says. The fresh water becomes bitter. Things will happen in the skies. All this will take place in the second stage of the tribulation period when the seven trumpets are blown. Um, we'll continue with this after we come back from our break. All right. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>